the sexual instinct represents a way of being interested in ourselves. It's a way of being kind of turned on by ourselves. And I don't mean like aroused, turned on. I just mean like activated, turned on. It's like a trust that your own pleasure is important. And I don't just mean in the context of sex, but it's just like, it's a trust that like, that like there is a purpose to your own pleasure. And I don't mean to get like super spiritual or like religious or anything like that, but like it is its own sacred thing and it should be honored and you should deserve to be indulgent in that way. Welcome to another episode of What It's Like to Be You. I am Josh Levine, your host, and I'm very excited to welcome my friends, John Lukovich and Alexandra Arroyo Acevedo to the show today. We are talking about their upcoming course that they're offering through the Enneagram School on the sexual instinct. It is on July 30th. It's a four part course. So it's every, it's, it's going to be every week for two hours in the evenings, Eastern time, except there's going to be one week in the middle where you skip. And uh, you can check out the information at the Enneagram School.com. John and Alexandra have been on the show before. They are co hosts on the Big Hormone Enneagram podcast. And also, John wrote a book called The Instinctual Drives in the Enneagram, which is a seminal work on the topic. This conversation is all about what John and Alexandra are going to present in their class and what you can expect if you sign up in terms of what practices you'll be invited into, et cetera. But before we do that, I want to set a little bit of context. If you're new to the Enneagram, you've probably understood the Enneagram as just a system of nine basic personality types. Really, it's a lot more complex than that. There's, first of all, lots of ways of subtyping within those nine types. And also the Enneagram deals with a whole dimension of the personality and psychology that is the, our instinctual drives. The instinctual drives are what we share with other mammals in the animal kingdom, and they are the drives to self-preserve, the sexual drive, and the social drive. The sexual drive is, in our view, widely misunderstood in the Enneagram world. It's often characterized as the one-to-one -one instinct, which we believe is actually a facet of the social drive. And so there's a lot of unpacking to do about what the sexual instinct really is, its biological and evolutionary origins and purpose, and how it manifests and functions in the human personality. In fact, the personality really is a sexual ornamentation. Something really important to understand about the instincts is that everyone has all three, but in a particular person, they tend to come in a stack of priority, meaning one instinct is dominant and one instinct is in your quote unquote blind spot. So because there are three possible slots, there are six possible stackings, which makes the instincts basically its own personality typology that's kind of orthogonal to the nine Enneagram types. This is really important context for this conversation if you're not familiar with it, because we talk about how people with different dominant instincts will relate to their sexual instincts. So for example, if you're self-preservation dominant, how your experience of and relationship with your sexuality is gonna be different than if you're social dominant or sexual dominant. This conversation is all about the sexual instinct as distinct from the social instinct and the self-preservation instinct. And we're going to talk about how do you get in touch with your own sexual instinct? That's kind of what the class is all about. It's not about how do you have more sex or how do you flirt better or anything like that? It's like, how do you know your own sexual flavor and how do you express that in a way that's true to you? And um, I'm personally really excited about this class. I don't think there's anything else like it in the Enneagram world. And it's there's just so much misunderstanding about the sexual instinct as well, like in the Enneagram world, but more broadly society at large, there's so much dark, weird energy about sex. And we've seen, for example, I'm thinking of the Me Too movement, what happens when people are not authentically in touch with themselves sexually and are not able to act sexually in a way that is healthy and self-honoring and other honoring. And what this class is, is about how you do that, how you how you interact with your own sexual instinct in a way that doesn't even necessarily have to have an object as its focus. It's just your own relationship with yourself, how the sexual instinct helps you to renew interest in yourself, to be, to kind of, to feel yourself, you know, to feel good, to feel confident, to feel like you're um, just, yeah, like to feel yourself. And I really can't th think of people that I would trust more to teach this class than John and Alexandra. And, um, one other thing to say is that John and Alexandra are recently engaged and literally, I mean, like within the last couple of weeks. So it just feels right to offer this course on the heels of that and with that energy. And also it's summertime. So I'm really excited to present the sexual instinct course at the Enneagram school with John and Alexandra and for you to learn from them through this conversation, see what it's about and see if you're interested in joining. So without further ado, here are John and Alexandra. Mm -hmm. So let's just start with what was the inspiration for 
offering this class? I think the main the main inspiration was that in uh, our view, majority of people are sexual blind and that there is not a lot of places you can point to in a clear way if you're working on your sexual instinct, whether you're dominant, middle or blind um, that are out there. And, you know, when you talk about developing your self-preservation instincts, most people have some sense of what that would mean, whether it's be like healthier or taking care of yourself or being more grounded or being more responsible with whatever, um, something along those lines. Talking about working on your social instincts. I think most people understand the value of emotional intelligence and learning to connect with yourself and others better and, um, you know, developing yourself as a person. But when you talk about developing sexual instinct, it's like, does that mean have more sex or does that mean get more uh, obnoxious in some way? Yes. Uh, or, you know, <laughs> is it? Uh, yeah. What is it? And I think that, you know, it's not only an interesting exploration, but I think that um, regardless of what our blind spot is, uh, and I'm not sure I was trying to say this is just for people with sexual blind spot, but regardless of what our blind spot is, um, that missing element uh, has an enormous cost on the goals of our dominant instinct. You know, that if we're if I'm, you know, speaking for myself as a social blind, my neglect of social has cost me significantly, not just in social, but in self present sexual. And um, but, you know, even if you're dominant sexual instinct uh, there, again, that lack of sort of things to point to of ways to kind of. Uh, it's, it's like a, it's like we're missing vocabulary in a certain way. And so I want to provide a way that people can explore sexual instincts, explore what it means for them, how it works in them, understand it cognitively very well, but also understand it, uh, you know, in their own bodies and mm -hmm. in a way that is not just about getting a partner. Um, you know, it's about awakening something within yourself. So, John, as you were talking about how it's kind of obvious how to develop yourself from the point of view of the self pres instinct. Like you go to the gym and you get fit or you organize your finances or you set up your house and your abode in some kind of way that makes you more grounded or whatever. There's kind of like self actualization through the self pres instinct tends to be the dominant lens of self actualization in our culture. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, to a much lesser degree, the social instinct is also has a place in our culture in terms of like being being a better leader or being more emotionally intelligent and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, going to therapy, all that kind of stuff. Right, right, mm -hmm. right, right. Um, but what it means to sexually self-actualize is mm -hmm. not really discussed in, at least uh, broadly in our culture. And I think that a lot of people have, um, first of all, questions about what that actually is. And also mm -hmm. a sense of like, hidden resistances to it like that feels narcissistic or what does it mean am i just gonna For like sure. you know have a bunch of have a bunch of sexual partners now is it de so what what does it actually mean to develop yourself sexually and what why would one choose to do that yeah great question um so you know first thing i want to just like say because we are speaking sort of in terms of this like you know four-part course or whatever mm -hmm. that that topic in and of itself is like too broad to fully cover and develop in all dimensions right because it can be like like there's things about um things about like masculine and feminine there's like sort of weird little like pseudo tantra courses and you know, all these kind of ways that people will think about or like, you know, self-pleasure workshops and, all, you know, and that's not what we're going for or anything like that. But from my point of view, the thing that I have noticed in working with people of all different stackings and in my own self and whatever, that the kind of inner dimension or the, yeah, the, the, the part of self-actualization of sexual instinct that's not about just being like a better partner or being more attractive or you know whatever is um 
is a way that the sexual instinct represents a kind of a way of being interested in ourselves. It's a way of being kind of turned on by ourselves. And I don't mean like aroused, turned on. I just mean like activated, turned on. And that when we are in touch with our sexual instinct and, you know, to be very clear, when we're in touch with it, regardless of stacking, like when we're mm -hmm. actually having a living relationship with our sexual instinct, there is a way in which we are like um, activated by our personhood that we're turned on that we're discovering things about ourselves that we're like you know that term like feeling ourselves you know i always compare it to like a musician or a painter and part of the journey in a creative process is that you're interested in and excited by what you are going to if you're making music like what you're going what sounds you're going to make or if you're drawing or painting what colors am I going to use? What images am I going to use? What's going to resonate with me in that way? And it's like, it's a self interest. that's not narcissistic. It's mm -hmm. can become mm -hmm. narcissistic, but it's just sort of like, it's, I, I want to know what's coming next in me. And that I think is like the inner part of development with sexual instinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To me, it also feels like a very primal and base self expression. You know, and in a conversation that we had not too long ago, we were just discussing the sexual instinct as um, one of the most important things about it is to cultivate the sense of self-renewal so that you're not stagnating. And granted, there are ways to do that with self-pres and there are ways to do that with social. But I think myself as a sexual blind, like finding ways to constantly be shedding what no longer is vital for me. Um, in order to make space for what is like fresh and oncoming and new, like that's what relates, that's what, that's how we can relate it to um, the artist thing that John was talking about. Like what is the, the, like the, like almost like an astrology with like your rising sign. What is the rising thing about you that you want to be expressing? You know, what is the rising thing about you at all? You're making something rise. <laughs> Shut up, John. <laughs> I, I had to. <laughs> I'll say this also, um, one thing that as a sexual blind, I have been more aware of just as time goes on and I'm more familiar with the instincts and the Enneagram and just like my experience here as like a person on the planet is another value point within the sexual instinct is that it has been able to help me find myself outside of my sort of like self pres what can I do, my physical body, you know, or like outside of the social roles of friend and partner and sister and you know this kind of stuff like the i can i know the value that i bring as a um as a social object and as a self-pres object but there's a certain way that there's like the sexual part of myself has been um has been not as clear you know and not only has it not been as clear but it's also i didn't really know why i should try to develop that you know, why should yeah, I develop yeah. like a self interest? Why should I want to um, know what like a particular flavor I have? And there's a lot of answers to that. One is because I have become more interested in myself. And that's not from a vain perspective, or it's not from like, um, be it's not from being it's not, how do I say it? It's not from a self fish place either. But it's like, the questions are, am I enjoying myself? Like, am I responding right. to the things that I that I want? And that they'd have nothing to do with like my relationships with other people in a certain way, like my social role in society, whether something is responsible or not. It's just about like, what is, what is going to get me, what is going to make me excited about the next day with this person, mm -hmm. with my mm -hmm. own life, with myself, you know, there's a kind of inner fuel that just keeps you kind of excited to be alive that I think also belongs to the social instinct or I'm sorry, to the sexual instinct. So there's bias there. Yeah. That's a really important thing you just said. And I, I'm relating to it also myself. Like, it's like when I, when I first started dating my girlfriend, uh, when we weren't, when we weren't <laughs> like officially, like we weren't like official yet, you know, mm -hmm. there was, there was a lot of, there was this dynamic where, um, she's a self press type. And like, there was this dynamic where, um, where where her self pres needs weren't getting met, she wasn't really. She was kind of closed in herself and like not available for the kind of social connection that I was kind of craving. And as a social attachment type, I kind of that would put me into a a reactive headspace where I'd be trying to like get her to connect with me socially. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that as a way to (laughs) like unconsciously spark some kind of chemistry. Like I thought chemistry would be, that was the way to do it. Like, like look each other in the eye and create the emotional connection and whatever. And she just wasn't available (laughs) for it, you know? And then when she wasn't there, I felt like my needs weren't weren't getting met as a social Mm -hmm. type. And then that created this whole like loop, you know? Yeah. Um, And she felt missed because she was hungry and I wasn't like helping her work through that. You know, it's like trying to like have a conversation (laughs) with her. So, um, and like a piece of advice that John gave me that was really helpful was, um, basically just like, you know, next time you're hanging out and you're in that state, just like kind of go back inside yourself and then just start like entertaining yourself. Just, you know, Mm. just entertain yourself, like just disconnect in a not like disconnect, whatever, like push her away or whatever, but just be like, right, right. Just come back to yourself and just like, remember what you find funny or amusing or whatever about her, about this moment, about some thing you're looking at. And what ended up happening was we were like walking through this village. Uh, we were like staying in an Airbnb. So we were like walking through kind of like just window shopping and stuff like that. And I started just getting interested in stuff that was in the windows, going to the, going into the shops and just turning into the kind of like accessing a de- like an unselfconscious, almost like clownish state. Yeah. Where I was just like, I was just being a clown, you know, being, yeah, yeah. And just making myself laugh, you know, and the, and it actually, it completely decalcified the whole dynamic that we were in. It just, it totally. introduced this whole different energy where I was like throwing my own party and she was like feeling, she got magnetized by that. And then all of a right. sudden, all of a sudden we had like, chemistry we had like a sexual dynamic yeah. going on <laughs> yeah. right, right. you know yeah. and that was right. like that was like a pretty big eye-opening experience for me you know like oh this is that was a whole mode of being that i didn't i wouldn't have access i wouldn't have tried that if it weren't for john's mm-hmm. like advice and that was like awakening my sexual instinct and kind of renewing interest in myself as a way to revive the dynamic you know totally yeah i mean i relate to a lot we're the same stacking very similar right, right. typologically also so yeah i totally relate to that there have been so many times that i'm just especially being a social dominant that i'm just putting sexual like down there and i'm like no no no, it's not fun it's serious like be serious with me look me in the eyes that kind of stuff and then i have to as exactly as you said kind of disconnect find my own source of like um uh interest and then the it's just like the the state of the um the energetic state changes. Mm-hmm. I'm in a pleasurable place. And so I can pull John into a pleasurable place. But even so, like with John as a sexual type, the distortion that can come from being sexual dominant is that it can get very serious. You know, it can get like there's a fixation around it and stuff like that. So there are ways that even he needs to go back to like his own experience of the sexual instinct in order for us to balance it out together. Hmm. But yeah, one of the, I mean, like, you know, Alexander. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a stay at home cat father. And so Alexander <laughs> comes home from work and, uh, and, you know, I start messing with her just immediately and like, kind of, you know, like, <laughs> like when she was coming home, um, she, uh, she would like was sneezing like in the hallway. And so then she walks and I just immediately like start you, you? kind of making fun of her. And then I like start messing with her clothes and her, you know, all the stuff. And I'm like, to, you know, it's just like, I'm like entertaining myself. <laughs> but it's like i'm like just you know she's i'm not doing anything that's like violating her or making her upset or no. anything but like i'm just kind of like ruffling her feathers mm-hmm. in a way that's like amusing to me and i'm just like kind of getting you know getting whatever on it and it's like and then it creates this dynamic between the two of us it's like fun we're playing and then she goes fun, after yeah. me yeah like you know i start you know reaching my hands in places and then she starts reaching her you know and it's just like it's like a whole the whole thing and so yeah that like idea of um what am i like what am i finding enjoyment or pleasure in in this moment Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. just like kind of being focused on that rather than like are we are we good you know (laughs) it's like is it like how is our connection you know and just that'll often break like that'll there's a there's a way that will one of one of us will do that to the other and it just kind of breaks whatever, uh, I don't know, the term, like just anytime it starts tension, get things get frozen up or something or get like a little whatever. We just, the, the, the spark, uh, we just hit that buzzard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go ahead. Well, to riff off of that, or maybe this is just a separate topic, there's um, so a book I was reading not too long ago on astrology, and one of the placements was like the fifth house, and the fifth house is associated with like pleasure and sex and, you know, 
uh, romance, um, you know, all of these kind of pleasurable states. But the I remember the description in the book was described that particular house as the reason it's okay. It said the reason pleasure is important is because it takes you to tomorrow. It, it, gives you a reason to want to keep going not to get like super fatalistic or anything like that but like it just it gives you a reason to be excited to want to be here and that's not in a goal orientation kind of like three-ish way it's not in a um like a discomfort escapism that can come with like seven or nine it's genuinely like i'm enjoying something and i want to be in that enjoyment whether that's mm -hmm. myself creative project i'm involved with a partner it's just your source of it's your source of pleasure and there are um i think like societally especially in the us but maybe everywhere um societally focusing on that can be really shamed it can be called frivolous it can be called irresponsible um it can be you know this kind of like pull yourself up by your bootstraps don't have fun you have responsibilities and things to do okay but then you've spent your whole life like amassing responsibility and um i don't know goals and whatever it is you're trying to do without having enjoyed your life at all mm -hmm. yeah yeah this is like something you guys have talked about before is how the sexual instinct is it's a source of play and mm -hmm. fun and lightness and i think yeah. that people tend to be like uh, drawn by the by the mystery and the intensity of the sex of sexual energy but also afraid of it and totally. you know yeah. it's 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 intense energy it's chaotic it can be messy um and to use you know like some of david gray's stuff like this like social and self-pres are much more stable energies you know mm -hmm. sexual energy is is what decalcifies things it's like fire and water you know it's 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 um yeah and so like we talk about like polarities and tensions and um, how those can be like f for me as a, as a sexual blind type, I've been sort of mystified by these terms. Like what does it mean to occupy a pole or to have it or to have, to have a polarity with someone as a social type and a triple attachment type. I find myself often smoothing differences you know, as a reflex or like finding, finding commonality and like, oh, you're like this, I'm like this too or whatever. Um, and having a lens to actually like occupy, I'm over here, you're over there. And there's this creative tension between the two of us and in an interplay that creates a kind of renewable chemistry between us that doesn't just diffuse into a homogenous connection. Mm -hmm. That's like part of the sexual instinct. And it's also part of what yeah. is scary about the sexual instinct because it is highlighting differences yeah. and highlighting distance, you know, between mm -hmm. us. Um, and you know, tension, tension between those things invites either attraction or repulsion, you know? And so there's also in that there's the threat of repulsion. Like if I, if I, if I consolidate myself and I occupy this pole, then maybe it, I repel this person, uh, which is right. very, yeah. that's anyway. So there's all, there's all scary. this like <laughs> scary stuff, you know, involved in the sexual instinct. And so I know mm -hmm. part of your yeah. intention with this class is like to make it fun, to be, to be able to approach polarities and tension in a way that feels non-threatening and just, yeah. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, with, in my, from my point of view, part of what is, there's so many scary things about the sexual instinct. Mm -hmm. For one thing, you can't choose who you're attracted to. Right. And yeah. you can't yeah. make somebody be attracted to you. It has its own logic. It has its own, you know, yeah. even intelligence, in, you know, yeah intelligence uh and some people like you know fall out of attraction and you can't really choose that um but also you know there's this play and pleasure piece but then there's also piece that's like it is very serious you know and mm -hmm. it's it's sort of a contradiction i think to some in some people's experience where it's like sacred and profane at the same time mm -hmm. you know da da david um you know, puts the uh, representing the instincts with elements and puts fire and water as the sexual because it's got this mercurial, it's both and in a certain way. And so sometimes culturally, like I'll, uh, you know, I when I, when people started coming to me with a lot of like sexual issues, I started following and looking up like, you know, all kinds of like sex experts and sex therapists and all their, you know, and social media and stuff like this and reading books and um, 
you know, there is kind of like a sex sexuality and sexual instinct is just like for your pleasure. It's just for fun. And like, you know, just make sure that you're playing safe kind of, it's got this kind of reductive functional quality. And yet if you've had like a really special sexual experience, uh, it, you know, with a partner or some, something just transformative in yourself, it takes you to a very, like, another place in yourself a very like a special place and very sacred place mm -hmm. but yeah back to your talk about the the fear um yeah it's like uh it is like a it's a leaning back into and kind of like trying to trust in your own energy and your own separateness and feeling your own energy in your separateness from your partner like alexander can speak on it more but um uh she she often brings up this Esther Perel uh, example of intimacy mm -hmm. versus uh, what well, attraction eroticism what, what, eroticism mm -hmm. and now eroticism requires distance and so part of what can be difficult about the sexual instinct uh, is there's a certain breaking away from a either a structure or a pattern or a dynamic it doesn't mean actually leaving it but there's certain standing in your own self and mm -hmm. if you're not in touch with your sexual instinct. Uh, it's harder to do that in a way that feels embodied and empowered because you're like, you're not feeling yourself. So why would you stand yeah. in yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, so that is like a big risk for the personality, risk for the ego. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's just, I mean, I could just go on and on, but I'll. Yeah. Well, just to even go off of that, and this is not very long, but even just if you're not standing in your own pole, for example, like if you're not standing in your own sexuality, and we'll say that within the context of like the sexual instinct, your own in yourselfness, feeling yourselfness, um, you actually can't be a part of a pole. You know, and I don't mean there is a way that we're all kind of subconsciously doing things, but like if you cannot be in yourself, how can you be responsive, you know, um, to another person? Like, and so, or to another thing, you know, to another like interest or something like that. So part of what we want to talk about, going back to the fear part of it is, um, is how to recognize your own your own self interest, your own flavor, and then to recognize how to be responsive to, you know, flavors or excitations outside of yourself. Because like as a sexual blind, like it's really never not going to feel scary to me. It's never going to not feel destabilizing. So the idea of of trying to approach it in a way that seems non threatening, um, in a certain way, actually goes against the essence of the sexual instinct. Well, I'll say that there's a way in which I think somebody uh, you can experience like the charge of the sexual instinct as something threatening and scary. But you can experience that as just bad and threatening and scary or Where's that life kind of you? charge is having is as having potential is having mm -hmm. like you can be friendly with the fear or friendly with the charge. And, you know, part of what the sexual, like somebody who's a sexual type is doing unconsciously is they are over trusting in that, like, kind of uh, whatever disruption, you know, they're, they're saying like, oh, the, the disruption is always fecund, right? And part of being sexual blind is like, I, I, it's hard for me to see how this, 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 this disruption can turn out well. You know, mm -hmm. it can, it, it, how, how it can actually be life giving because it's breaking something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. What are you smiling about? I'm just, the, you're, I'm just it's a good use of the word fecund. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can talk no, about that word a, for a second. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a big sexual <laughs> word. <laughs> that's a David Gray favorite. It is? Fecundity. That makes, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. That makes total oh, sense. Yeah. He would love that word. Yeah. It's kind of gross. Yeah. It's kind of a gross word. It's all gross. One of the things that's scary about getting in touch with a sexual instinct is not, and, and this could be true for sexual dominance as well, is not, um, how do I put this? It's not because the sexual instinct is scary and I'm learning to have a relationship with it. It's that we might see that the way that we've organized our lives without the sexual instinct or being led by the sexual instinct in an unintegrated way like the way that we've set up our lives uh we've done it in a way that has somehow strangled some of our life force like that there might be a way that we have to like we if like a lot mm -hmm. of people are afraid of 
getting in touch with their sexual instinct because they might recognize, oh, maybe I'm not attracted to my partner. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, we've had people who are very like sexually promiscuous say, I don't want to get in touch with my sexual instinct because I might learn that I'm not attracted to the people I'm sleeping with. And I, I want that option. I want, I want, mm -hmm. the I want to be able yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, people will learn like, oh, I'm like the, pl like, even like the city I live in is not doing it for me, you know, or the career I've chosen is one that is not, doesn't, ha doesn't leave room for me to explore this or incorporate it into just my day to day. So there's a lot of like compartmentalizations and even somebody who's sexual dominant might go, oh, I've just been like, you know, our, our object relations co-opt all of our uh, instinctual drives. And I don't just mean the, you know, frustration, attachment, rejection. I mean, just like the patterned relationships we've had from early in life. And so often what sexual types will do is they will think that they are being new and creative and vivifying and shedding, shedding the skin of the serpent skin, snake skin or whatever. And when really they're just replaying the same old bullshit patterns of their early life in new relationships. Right. Mm. And so yeah. it's like, even if you're sexual dominant, it doesn't mean it, like it's, it can be totally just as skewed as somebody sexual blind. It can be totally yeah. repetitive mm -hmm. and, and yeah. totally frozen in the same way. So yeah. yeah, that's a big part of it is like, maybe it's, maybe I'm actually fine in a certain way with my sexual instinct, but then it's like, but all the things it's going to impact if I recognize how offline it's been and what it would mean if I turn it on. Mm-hmm. I have one other topic I want to bring up, which is um, how, and, and you guys have explored this on, on BHE, uh, for listeners who don't know what that is, the Big Hormone Enneagram podcast, but <laughs> it's the, the way that the different instinctual stackings like approach and experience sex, where, for example, like, if, like let's say you're a self-pres type and we're talking about the sexual instincts, you might have an unconscious... Um, assumption that we're talking about just like the physical act of sex and an orgasm, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. like a lot of self pres types, um, like the, the sexual appetite and what it mm -hmm. means to, and just like the physical sensations of sex and, um, yeah, like the goal of the orgasm and stuff like that. That's kind of like a way that I've seen some self pres types approach sex or social types approaching sex as a way to feel more emotionally connected. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's something I have energy around um, mm -hmm. distilling or not dist distilling, but making distinctions, <laughs> I forgot the word, mm -hmm. uh, in during the course. Um, because, yeah, I think there are a lot of obviously mistyping is like a rampant thing. It's sexual right, yeah. to be to type yourself as a sexual type, of course, seems like the most appealing thing just because it often gets um it often gets described as being like the most passionate or the most intense or the most uh, creative or the most like uh, romantic, you know, stuff like that. And these are it, it, sure, maybe sometimes, but often, you know, there's a lot of times where it's not. So one of the things that I want to do in the course and that John and I are going to be doing is pulling apart the differences between like what is what is social versus what is sexual, because mm -hmm. a lot of like, you know, popularly the sexual instinct is described as the one on the one to one instinct, which is oh, yeah. the social instinct. <laughs> right. You know, that's not a sexual yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. It's that's in, intimacy is a social thing. Um, wanting to know somebody very deeply, wanting to be engaged in like a um, like, yeah, just a very intimate conversation. That's social stuff. Those are social charges and social activations versus, yeah, the self prize element. Oh, and even another thing with the social type, because you mentioned the way that that can be confused. Another way that um, sexual can kind of be co-opted by social is people can use like promiscuity or player or something like that as a social symbol, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, Sorry. yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, as a social signifier, that's not a sexual thing at all. You can ha you can be a person that is promiscuous, but use it as just like a social object, as a social ornament for yourself without actually being engaged in any kind of, um, in anything that's really pulling at you. And then again, for the self prez yeah, the um, the physical kind of sensual aspects of the physical on physical experience can also often be confused for um, 
for the sexual instinct. Sensual, I do believe, belongs a lot to the self-pres instinct or to just the body center or something like that. Sensuality, I think, is more of a body thing, whereas sexuality is its own specific thing. You can be mm -hmm. a sensual person without being a sexual person. You can be um, connected to your sense of sensuality without, while still holding sexuality at bay. And it's even like people will approach their sexual experiences from a lens of well, what is normal for somebody my age or my yeah, yes, yes. social group yeah. like mm -hmm. all right i've had like like so you know i'm i'm having sexual experiences so i can you know maybe prove to myself that i am a desirable person or i do these kinds of sexual acts because this is what you know like you know, oh, I've I've tried, uh, I don't know, like uh, threesome or, you know, something like like it's it's kind of like, oh, this is my resume for how I'm daring, you know, in this way. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how I'll see people hold it. And then like, mm -hmm. um, man, like, you know, it, there's nothing against polyamory, but like uh, on, like polyamory influencers on social media are like the most social sexual blind, like thing I've ever seen because it's so much of, uh, it's so inhabiting, um, labels and relationship agreements and, and, and how you deescalate a breakup when your partner has a break, you know, it's like these kind of things that is like, it's just so, uh, there's a, there's a distancing thing that we have from the loss of self aspect that a really alive sexual uh, experience brings us into which to your to something you said earlier about you know the heart is like i think all three instincts need to be present and you know the the physical sensual part needs to be there the connected part needs to be there and the chemistry needs to be there mm -hmm. and you know uh we've been we talked you know we've been sort of talking about um people who are who are sexual blind and and like what that's like of just there's no spark or it's just like a i don't know mechanical act or something but you know like speaking as a social blind there's no social instinct there uh it becomes a performance to be to be like trying to get your partner to desire you you know to just like it's it's like not it's not in it either you know unless yeah, the, the all sense. three instincts are in there yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. let's let's talk more about the heart and the okay. heart's relationship with the instincts. And, you know, one thing that is, um, one thing that I find really uh, just like f endlessly fascinating is, and this we talk about this is sort of related to the social distinction or the social confusion with the sexual instinct, but how people have like, um, people can have an image of what sexuality is versus a, and that is like totally far apart from their actual felt sense experience of it. And a lot of people enter and a flirtation all the way to an actual sexual encounter and experience from a performing place, you know, with themselves not actually present in it. And so what does it mean to actually have sex or to be sexual as oneself? Mm. And, um, as a sexual blind social dominant three, I would say this is, this has been like a kind of a lifelong struggle for me. Um, just what does it mean? How do I do that? You know, how do I actually be myself? Uh, not mm -hmm. just be performing. Like I need, for example, I need, I need to make sure that like I'm doing a good job and like getting my partner to orgasm or, and that's like the whole focus or how do I, and actually another point you said, like around the sexual instinct loss of self, it's like if you're if you're mm -hmm. controlling the sexual experience or if you're approaching mm -hmm. it from a social place or if you aren't really in it, you actually can't lose yourself. It's kind of interesting. Like you have right. to actually yep. be there so that you can lose yourself. Yeah. No, and yeah. what I was yeah. going to say uh, before you brought that point up was yeah. <laughs> to be yourself, you need to lose yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a circularity like, there too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's sort of yeah, a yeah. paradox, but it's, it, it, you know, the the way to like, lose yourself has to do with a certain amount of basically trust. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean safety trust. Like that's part of it. But often I think that part gets emphasized like a lot, right? Like that we're like consenting and that we're doing this together. And you know, that's very important. But um, and yeah, like also like, again, I just I have in my head when I explored all these different like 
sex therapists and stuff like this, like what they'd emphasize. And it was, it was often probably through the lens of their instinctual bias. And, Mm -hmm. you know, someone's like, it's all about intimacy and connection and being really connected to your partner. And I was like, I don't think that, you know, so yeah, there's, but there's a certain uh, way of trusting your partner, but trusting the energy between the two of you, you know, it's like, I can trust Alexandra, but it's, and she can trust me, but we're, when we're like, just, it is like this third force enters, you know, and mm-hmm. we're just obeying it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's really, it has its own life, but we're trusting it. And we're kind of both getting out of our, uh, our a- analysis about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This also goes back to what I said earlier about like, you just have to be so in your own experience and your own connection to, I don't know, the pleasure that you're seeking or experiencing already. And your partner. So there is, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a trust that happens externally, but like, I think from a sexual blind perspective, um, it's like a trust that your own pleasure is important. And I don't just mean in the context of go. sex, but it's just yeah. like, it's a trust that like, that like there is a purpose to your own pleasure. And I don't mean to get like super spiritual or like religious or anything like that, but like it is its own sacred thing and it should be honored and you should deserve to be indulgent in that way, you know? And, and that is the way like the inness with your own sexual instinct is the only is also the only way you're going to get it. You know, it's the only way you're going to be receptive or giving in that way. And and even in the like like what I was saying about partner is like even in the sexual act, like like I trust in my enjoyment of Alexandra. Mm-hmm. You know, and like and I like and then I can tell like you know and when it when things are good uh i can tell you know she's enjoying me and so it's like we're still in ourselves enjoying ourselves but we're in ourselves enjoying ourselves and enjoying each other you know what i'm saying like there are these other layers to it where it's like we're just in we're 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 embodying that we're enjoying each other so there's like Mm -hmm. this this mutual trust and build you know and it's like yeah does that make sense yeah uh not to be too whatever detailed about something, but I like, I remember I had a kind of epiphany once a couple years ago where I think it was around the time that I started like really exploring my relationship with the sexual instinct via this material that we were kind of exploring all, as a group. And um, I like there was a period, especially like after my last relationship where I was like just really just not hooking up at all, you know? And then, and then I would have these, um, like I would occasionally get involved with someone and my experience of myself sexually was like, I was sort of, um, finding myself like surrendering to a different kind of animal energy, um, Mm -hmm. where I was like, there was like this loop that sort of got like, connected between me and my sexual partner where it was like i surrendered to my own just enjoyment of her and then Mm -hmm. what i could what i what i what i intuited or like what i started uh, noticing was that um she was like noticing that i was just surrendered into that enjoyment and so it was like turning her on that i was just exactly unselfconsciously yeah, enjoying her in it you know mm-hmm. what i mean mm-hmm. and then that kind of activated a sense of like and now she's enjoying me and then her yeah. her unselfconscious enjoyment right. of me was turning me on but and there's like this virtuous cycle now and it's totally yeah, different it's yeah. a totally different dimension than like i'm gonna get you off and you're gonna get me off and now we're like totally. we've exactly. yeah. had sex right you know and then really? done. right yeah. Yeah. right <laughs> yeah um exactly yeah, yeah. exactly you can't really like uh it, it's it can be hard to drop into what i'm really enjoying if i'm not like trusting and knowing like my own place of enjoyment in myself and i think you know i'm t- you know i'm saying like people can understand the like like the getting off part of a sexual experience but then but like the actual like the part that like you you know you'll that you'll really 
come away with that you really feel involved in is this certain other kind of like what we're calling enjoyment. And that part of us is something that we need to like actually spend time developing our relationship with. But yeah, it's like, I need to, I need to make room for that. I need to know that place in myself. And so that's like that kind of that piece, I think is what a lot of our, a lot of this, like this, this class will be about is like trying to just cultivate that as a foundation for anything else. Because it's like, I kind of, I consider, for example, um, my finding the Enneagram or my finding the finding Egypt, a kind of sexual instinct experience that has nothing to do with a partner, but it's just like, I'm not going to be cha I'm not going to be the same on the other side of this thing. Like I'm going to lose something of uh, myself. You yeah. You know, like this is like, this is going to blow open doors that I can't shut again. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you enter like a relationship like that or a, a experience like that or anything, uh, there's a sense of, I'm going to be different on the other side of this. I'm going to be reconstituted or revised. Mm -hmm. And I think that especially, you know, we're talking sexual blind, won't trust that. That will seem destabilizing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes sexual dominant can be self-destructive and think it's that same thing. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about like, like one of the basic polarities of the sexual instinct, masculinity and femininity? and just how you think about that and how, how that lives in you. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you want to go baby? I need to think about it. Honestly, I don't have it. something just like loaded up and ready to go. Well, I'll say that I, I've worked individually with people who are, uh, queer and who are trans. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a masculine feminine polarity, but it doesn't necessarily accord with, gender and yeah. bodies and all those things. So I just want to make mm -hmm. that caveat or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's sort of archetypes and most of our way we experience these archetypes is through these cultural overlays and images rather than direct inner experiences. And I can't really like point to like, oh, this is what the inner experience feels like of masculinity or femininity. But I think that there are um ways of holding attention ways of holding boundaries ways of relinquishing them uh that roughly correspond to to ways that we like it the, the ways that we connect to something archetypal in ourselves and something that we locate these for lack of a better term energetic expressions within ourselves through mm -hmm. and so um you know, there are like, like I can, I, I, I consider myself pretty, um, like I'm more at home with masculine, but I, I definitely, uh, feel myself accessing what I would consider feminine energy on the regular. And so it's sort of like one of the things I've noticed in people with a strong sexual instinct, like I think of Prince, for example, is he can play with a lot on a polarity mm -hmm. in his image, in his behavior, in his movement, uh, in his music. And he's not stuck on one pole or the other. Mm -hmm. So it's not about like, all right, now be a very masculine man or be a very feminine woman. But there's a, there's a way that I'm related to myself where this, these, these charges can be held. And with, you know, with my partner, Alexander, like, <laughs> I can hold some end of a polarity. I'm not even like sort of uh, labeling it mentally of what end I'm holding, but our entunement with each other and our natural chemistry means she can go to the other end of that polarity in a, in a way that's like an equal but opposite charge. And we can just like meet each other and flip polarity multiple times over. And it's mercurial, you know, it's that thing. So like, I don't know if I'm really answering your question really clearly, but to kind of lay out that territory because we do talk about polarity, but it's like a, it's always dynamic and it is below the level of like our cognition, even though we can retroactively try to like kind of map what's going on. But it is like when I work with people with a sexual instinct, it's about um, kind of what we were saying earlier about, oh, this might um, change me. And I'm, I'm fearful of that versus I see promise in that possibility of changing myself. 
-hmm. it's kind of like that where it's like um you know am i containing a certain either polit like like whole clinging to one end of a pole or downplaying polarity in myself because i'm afraid of the destabilizing factor that will cause my own psyche or am i allowing myself to um to play and flirt and follow it in a way that's like the energy is alive. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Um, I'll, I'll add one thing about this. I, I think that this, these terms, masculinity and femininity are, um, are very socially charged, uh, sure. as mm -hmm. well, you know, and to define them feels threatening. It's like, it's like, Oh my God, am I going to be, um, uh, uh, trouble. you know, you know, am I going to be in trouble? Yeah. By, you know, masculine is this and feminine is this and somebody's going to get mm -hmm. mad at me for whatever I say. Um, but there is this way that like we have these kind of cultural archetypes of what these are, whether they're accurate or not, there's like, right. um, or true in an objective spiritual right. soulful sense or whatever. Um, and I can certainly say for myself that I, um, I tried to conform for a very long time to our more masculine archetype in a way that I think was inauthentic to me. Um, mm. Or, you know, I could, I could feel myself kind of holding myself a little bit more kind of rigidly as a way, like, cause I thought that's what a man is supposed to do, you know? Mm. Right. Right. Um, and as I've gotten more in touch, just more mature, first of all, as a person and more in touch with my sexual instinct, I realized that I there's a lot more fluidity in me and there's a lot more, um, what's the way to put it? Um, kind of softness and receptivity in me, um, mm. which I would have traditionally characterized as feminine qualities. And again, I hope no one gets mad at me, but whatever. There's this like, th <laughs> that's in me. And actually what I found is that the more I've been able to like be with that energy and kind of integrate it, the whatever my true masculine self has also exactly like exactly be come, come, come to life. And it's, it's less fixated it's less trying to be mm -hmm. something you know it's more just mm -hmm. relaxed um so they kind of like mutually internally support and take care of each other yeah. like the more my inner feminine is developed the more my inner masculine is yes. developed mm -hmm. and then they kind of create the space to counterbalance each other inside and then to what you're speaking to like in a in a flotation or a sexual dynamic or whatever because they're both alive in me i can kind of i can i can fluidly go between each pole and it's again mm -hmm. i'm still sexual blind mm -hmm. it's not like the most natural thing in the world for me but i just i trust that that's there you know um yeah. mm -hmm. and i'm not like embarrassed in a sexual encounter if like all of a sudden like my partner wants to take a dominant role for a minute you know or so it's like that's like right, you know what i'm right. saying totally, um, totally and there's like flip-flopping and stuff like that and so yeah <laughs> yeah no totally yeah. and uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you know i mean i've been kind of fascinated with um well, I mean, you're, you're, you're speaking, you're speaking to a lot of things, but one of the things that it evokes for me is like, uh, you know, Carl Jung, anima, animus dynamics and yeah, yeah. like that, you know, that, that there's a polarity in terms of your soul and mm -hmm. the, the union of opposites is like the, the sacred work. Right. And, um, you know, I, growing up especially as a male four uh like you know a straight male four like where i have all these like feelings and things uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like the arch the, the male the archetypes of of maleness in our culture yeah. are like you know and and it, it, I, I know i'm jumping all over the place but it's just bringing it up like and archetypes of maleness and then like just inherent misogyny i think it's all kind of related where it's like uh you know when when just to take male energy, for example, when you, when male energy does not have a a love, respect, and place and reverence for the feminine energy internally, you know, you see feminine energy as weak and functional and empty, and those like super masculine like military operator kind of guys are like trying to impress other men to get validation for their masculinity because it's not felt within. So it's like this empty parody of masculine energy right and so anyway just like there's so many implications where you know then it's like the feminine energy is itself not enjoyed other than a thing to like have my babies and get me off and so there's no that place of like enjoyment that we were speaking to earlier it almost doesn't exist because they're not enjoying themselves and all that fucking like uh mm -hmm. 
black rifle coffee and you know ar-15s or whatever and it's like it's just there, there, there's just like a lifelessness and yeah. so mm-hmm. part of part of in, in ha- like getting comfortable with these like i'm not speaking these polarities necessarily but like the sexual instinct it it does bring like water and life and and fecundity and, and greening to things in a certain way does that make sense yeah yeah um alexander i have a question for you um I okay. wonder if you have any um, kind of social self pres opinions about mm. um, the 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 way that you've experienced men embodying a kind of farcical masculinity, or mm. the way that went not being in touch with themselves sexually, and how that what the impact on you as a woman of that? Yeah, and, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to bring it back to something John said, um, as like. Um, I don't know, just, I I don't know the word to use. So I'll just say it, Um, that we were talking about polarity. The most obvious display of polarity would be with the masculine, feminine, and the masculine and feminine poles, but that those don't necessarily correspond to like biological sex or like the gender, you know, those are gonna exist however they exist, but they can exist wherever from whoever, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, as a person, as a person that is identified as female and as femininity, one of the ways that I have like responded to that kind of hyper masculinity that feels to me feels afraid of femininity is that it doesn't feel it doesn't actually feel like an honest pole. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel it feels dangerous. It feels unsafe and not dangerous and unsafe in the way that like sexual is kind of scary sometimes. But it feels like mm-hmm. like I'm not going to be um received or protected or held or there's no this person this like you know um example person has no experience with their own feminine energy within themselves so how are they going to know how to respond to it from me how are they even Mm going to know how to recognize it in myself Mm -hmm. you know and like as a person that identifies as feminine too i do think i'm comfortable with like more masculine sides and i knew how to like access those and that's like how i'm able to recognize that on an external level Mm-hmm. You know, so that would be my experience with that. Something else I wanted to say too is that as far as the polls go, I think social self press <laughs> the stacking, would be most likely to take those um, take those two poles and see themselves as like assigned to one of those poles mm-hmm. um, as either feminine or masculine. Or when really it's it, it's as you said earlier, it is more of a fluid motion, and the polarity will exist as polar to wherever you are you know that's part of like the fluidity of the sexual instinct if i happen to be kind of embracing more of a masculine energy the the thing that will be polar to me is something more feminine or if i'm you know and these are obviously just the words to use because they're very it's just easy language to use but if i'm more um in tune with my femininity the pole on the opposite end will be something more masculine Mm -hmm. you know and um and the reason for that poll is to create this kind of, is to create this tension. And in a way that creates excitement, polarity is exciting. <laughs> you know, it does create something. And that's very different than the, like, the harmony that comes from the social instinct. And of course, I'm a nine, so I'm going to use the word harmony. But social is comfortable and intimate and safe and familiar. Um, and it's trying to, you know, it in a certain way, it's trying to like, respect your boundaries and um this is all nine language but just like hold you keep you comfortable and all that kind of stuff there's a sexual instinct is trying to be disruptive it is trying to cause something that um that wakes you up to your own you-ness in order to respond to an otherness does that make sense beautifully said yeah i'm wondering so alexandra as a sexual blind like what it's meant to you to get in touch with your sexual instinct and how you know when it's you're in touch with it Mm. and basically the same question in reverse for you john like as a sexual dominant type how do you know when you're actually in balance with your sexual instinct versus when you're doing your fixated thing and Mm. um and how do you track the difference or what how do you experience it Mm. i mean this is both an easy question and a hard question which feels appropriate for the sexual instinct um and actually the easiest way to say it is i feel like i'm most in touch with my sexual instinct when there's a certain level of abandon that i'm in touch with 
there's a certain level of like of abandon. I like, don't care. Like recklessness abandon. or yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 And even recklessness feels like too <laughs> reckless a word, but there is a certain like, I don't care anymore. You know, there's a, and, and I don't mean like, um, I guess I don't need to qualify that, but there's, there's, yeah, there's a certain level of, I don't, I'm not paying attention to anything anymore. I'm just in my own experience. I'm just in this engagement, in this interaction. I'm just following, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of, um, there's a certain level of like, I don't know, there's like a certain level of tunnel vision and just kind of blocking everything else out. It's like really like nothing, nothing matters right now. And I'm also, and this is like a main way that I differentiate it from the social instinct also is that social is very like substantial. I can like, write an essay on what's happening with the social instinct you know like when i'm in a really engaging and i still experience it as passionate really engaging and like juicy kind of social um social um interaction i like know what's happening when i'm in it mm -hmm, it mm -hmm, still feels mm -hmm. really exhilarating and it feels really satisfying and it feels still it feels really pleasurable Mm -hmm. um, but there's a certain way that I am like maintaining my own boundaries. I'm control isn't necessarily going anywhere. I'm engaged in what's going on. But when I'm in more engaged in a sexual instinct thing that can still be in the social sphere, I have kind of lost track of, of time, awareness, concern for what's really going on. I'm just like in my own experience. It really is like an animalistic kind of, um, kind of tapping in. Mm -hmm. There's maybe more to say. I mean, there's definitely more to say, but um, that would be the easiest, yeah, start to that. I'll just a quick follow up. What's it like for you when you're like feeling yourself? Oh, <laughs> huh. Um, I mean, I kind of just <laughs> this may be cliche, but I just like kind of feel like I can take over the world. <laughs> uh -huh. Like it's um, like it just feels very much just like i'm not necessarily a part of the social milieu but like the world is just here for me and it just gets to like have me <laughs> <laughs> i'm <laughs> i'm just imposing myself on the world now and people and experiences and places and stuff like that like it's just it 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 feels like the phrase the world is my oyster mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what it feels like to me when i'm like really into myself or into what i'm doing or what i'm creating or something like that it's like it's all just for me. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> she's, she's the juiciest fruit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead, John. So, so you asked, would you ask the, you said it was reverse. I can't, I kind of the, I'm too the reverse to question. Well, so yeah, I mean, um, it's just interesting that you guys are one social dominant, one social blind and kind of talking mm -hmm. about what it means to be in a balanced, healthy relationship with your sexual instinct. And so, the reverse question for you is how how do you know and how do you track when you are in your sexual energy in a way that is healthy and balanced versus fixated and what is it like what does fixated sexual energy for you look like uh like when are you overdoing it versus when are you actually uh with it in a in an embodied way or a present way maybe alexander can help because maybe she can see it <laughs> Well, it makes me curious what Alexander would say. Um, uh, but so there's sort of two facets. When I'm with my lover, uh, there's this way that I'm uh, I'm not a person. I'm not like it's it is strange because it's almost like coming to the same place in a certain way because I'm not really checked in with myself. I am all my attention and energy is trying to get her to be into me. I see. It's like your psychological location is just out there. Like it's in, out. Yeah, yeah. It's out. Yeah. And you know, it's not full of social stuff or something like that, but it's like, you know, is she responding to me? Is this in my, you know, da, 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 da. Like mm -hmm. is she, does she like me? You know, how do I, you know, how do I look here? All this kind of stuff. Um, but I become like, a, I, I self objectify, I become basically like a tool mm. and then out in the world, there's a way in which, uh, overdoing it is like, I'm kind of destroying myself in some way. I'm trying to like blow out my fuses and, uh, I'm doing something maybe dangerous or I'm, um, like I used to 
I used to uh, literally play with uh, like fire a lot as it, you know, <laughs> when I was in high school, uh, like Molotov cocktails <laughs> and stuff like that. And like, um, <laughs> you know like trying to do like you know going too far with like a substance or something uh but there's there's a way i'm like pushing myself out of myself in a way i'm not i'm not think i'm not i've lost my sense of personhood my social instinct mm -hmm. um and so when i'm in my actual sexual energy i'm here as a person uh there is a see like it's 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 just like black and white versus color and it, you know in sort of dimensionality it's like like whoa i'm i'm like you know i'm fully it's it's like this these levels there's like this this fixated part i was talking about and then there's like oh i'm actually here as a person enjoying this and with this and met by my partner and met by her and we're reciprocal and then it's like you know, level three is like skyrocketing out of myself. You know, I'm where I'm like transcended or burst out of my own selfhood. And I'm like something more, if that makes sense. You know, it was like, uh, I've gone, be, I've, I've, I've found myself by losing myself at that right, point. Right. Does that make sense? It, it actually, it feels, it feels like what you're tracking is different levels of presence in the heart center. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like, it's like, um, if you're valuing if you're not valuing yourself you're trying to your psychological anchor is out there in her trying to get her to value you yeah. in a, through mm -hmm. the sexual yeah. instinct in a sexual way right getting her attracted yeah. to right. you mm -hmm. versus yeah. Resource, yeah. being in yourself valuing yourself um just amusing yourself and being a sexual being into yourself you know kind mm -hmm. of feeling yeah. yourself mm -hmm. sexually and then the sort of self-transcendence of just like well at level three which sounds yeah com sounds great complete <laughs> yeah. yeah complete like surrender to it or surrender right, to right. energy or whatever right right mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's interesting too because even though we're opposite stackings there is a way that like um when i am afraid of the sexual instinct it almost looks the same as when john's fixated with the sexual instinct there's a certain mm -hmm. way that like our attention moves from um from being in our own energy to being overly preoccupied with how the other person is receiving us you know, so John, when John is more in a more fixated place, it can, he can feel a little bit more anxious, a little bit more like over concerned with like yeah. how I'm responding to him with like, you know, is he collecting the sexual resource, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't mean, I don't mean like the physical act of sex, but like, is, am I excited? You know, there's like a, a he's tracking my responsiveness, even if nothing mm -hmm. happens. Um, and then, yeah, out in the world, it can be like a testing of like how provocative he is or like, you know, how far he can like take something or something like that, where um, when he is more relaxed with himself or like when when the sexual instinct has more like room to breathe, I experience I experience you, John, is more open to pleasure, actually. Like it's 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 actually it's more relaxed. And I don't mean more right. relaxed in like a nine ish yeah. kind of way or like that. It's like lost any kind of intensity or anything like that. But it's just more like it feels like there's a place for like the the sensation and the pleasure to land as yeah, opposed to totally. being overly external oh yeah overly externalized about it that makes sense yeah yeah mm -hmm. so last question can you give us a taste of like the kinds of um exercises maybe one or two just examples of like something that you might give someone to help get them in touch with their sexual instinct sure i mean the first one that comes to mind is the sensation practice, which um, we did this recently at a conference in the Netherlands. But one is just recognizing the sensational, <laughs> the, the sensation of each instinct so that you can differentiate them. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is something we'll talk about in the course a lot, but like sexual blinds will experience the excitation of their dominant instinct and potentially confuse it for sexual excitation. Excellent so if point. I'm yeah. getting a really yeah. strong social hit, I might confuse that for sexual attraction when sexual totally. attraction really feels completely different, you know? Mm -hmm. And then a person that like commits to a mm -hmm. relationship with that kind of energy finds out way too late, not that I have any experience with this, finds out way too late that there's not actually an excitation there, that there's not actually like, yeah, yeah. there's not actually a polarity there. 
So mm -hmm. that's one of the first things we'll be bringing into this. And we'll kind of keep coming back to this kind of grounding is like, what does there's like visualization exercises and stuff like that. Like what is the um, sensation of social in your body? What's mm -hmm. the sensation of self pres and what's the sensation of sexual? Because yeah. our stackings are never not going to be our stackings. We're never going to um, stop this kind of back and forth motion of like fixation and non fixation and presence and non presence and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. coming back to an anchor point is going to be something really important for every person with every instinct, like period. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, very well said. I think I alluded to it earlier where it's like finding not just through sensation, like which is the key and the ground and the most important part is like finding your own sexual instincts through sensation. But it's also going to be like reinforcing it aesthetically to oneself. Okay, mm -hmm. this is good. Yeah. Because, you know, it is a display, there is a certain mm -hmm. aesthetic That's adjacentness great, yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, an adornment. And adornment and enjoyment, you know, all those kind of things. And like, I mean, in the in the animal kingdom, and I mean, this is true in humans, but we just don't recognize it on these terms. But every all the bright colors and calls and dances and displays is, is a sexual instinct. You know, it's the it's mm -hmm. the it's the extended phenotype. And so there's there's a like there's an aesthetic component. And so like you know, I'm playing with this. How we're gonna do it or whatever, but. I want people to make like musical playlists, but also like kind of like image collages to mm -hmm. hone in on that. I found what has been really valuable in working with clients is helping them find a like a memory that they've had where they experience themselves turning on their own juice and it working either for themselves or for some or towards somebody else. Like and I've had mm -hmm. clients be like, oh, I just don't know anything about my sexual instinct and da 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 da. And then they'll be like, oh, but there was this one time or. <laughs> You know, they'll go like they'll go look through old images like I, I have I've had clients go through. I've asked them to like go through old images of themselves, mm -hmm. see what they liked at, about their look at any particular time. And they're like, oh, I liked my I felt I was feeling myself when I was wearing this thing or I was doing this thing yeah. or my hair was this way. And um, and, you know, uh, I mean, like the way that we feel. Is, uh, let's see how I say this. Part of our sexual display is it's not for everybody. It's mm -hmm. meant to be a very distinct flavor that repels most people, but turns on a limited number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not meant to be generally appealing and likable. And so that's something that especially if you're sexual blind and you have a really strong social instinct, can be a difficult thing to contend with because you what you're doing then is incorporating and integrating into your persona into your image things that might turn some people off that might alienate some people that might give them the you know wrong impression whatever that means mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so um so there's there's a way of finding how to do that in a way that actually feels true to oneself yeah that's a really mm -hmm. big deal so yeah, we're gonna try to yeah. figure out ways to do that. Like, you know, we've been joking that uh, Alexander jokes that my subtype of sexual instinct is uh, I'm a silk shirt R&B sexual type. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, not perfect. There's, <laughs> so there, there are these like different, uh, not, not like we're gonna classify things like that, but there's like a way that like, like, even though that's a joke, there's a way that like, I've, you know, I love old R and B and stuff. And like, there's a way that I'm like, hell yeah, definitely. You know, <laughs> right. yeah. That, that, yeah. that energy behind it is the way I experience my sexual energy, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. someone else might have a different, you know, there's like a Bjork sexual type and a whatever, mm -hmm. but like, mm -hmm. uh, I'll take, I'll take silk shirt R and B. So it's about finding your kind of like, energy your archetype something along those lines and and, yeah, and finding a way to your map mm -hmm. yeah and like like reinforcing it to yourself in a way that's natural mm -hmm. and encouraging rather than like artificial and like trying to talk yourself into something does that make sense yeah yeah mm -hmm. and a way that is ever renewing also like it needs to be in the moment it's yeah. a present experience so to find like the sexual map i would have made for myself like the way that i see myself 
um, a few years ago is very different from now and it's going to be very different in the future. It's going to be mm -hmm. a constantly renewing thing. Whatever stays great, I'm still into it. And if something goes, maybe I'll be into it again in the future, but not now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right yeah cool well uh i'm really excited about you guys offering this course and um, oh, any, yeah. any final any too. final thoughts here <clears throat> we're excited about it we're excited about it there's a lot of energy here um and you know this is just going to be one of those things i guess i got i guess i kind of want to manage people's expectations like this is not going to be a, a a course on seduction or whatever. This is going to be finding your own sexual flavor, learning how to respond to the things that excite you, learning how to recognize mm -hmm. your responsiveness, that yeah. kind of stuff. And of course, as with the sexual instinct, as with any of the instincts, this is not this. There's, it's not going to cover everything, but we're going to really hit the most important things. Yeah, beautiful, cool. Yeah, and hopefully it becomes a jumping off point to explore things in it, like. Like it'll kick up enough that we'll like start up the next round of uh, of interesting stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. deeper, mm -hmm. interesting stuff. Yeah, I'll just say one final thing. I, I can't help myself as a social self press type. It's <laughs> like this. This is such an important topic. Mm -hmm. It's such an important mm -hmm. topic because it's. I th I'm thinking about like the Me Too movement at, for as an example, yeah. and just just how much the dark underbelly shadow of oh, yeah. sexual energy operates in our culture and how it comes out in these perverse forms. And when men aren't, uh, men in particular, what, you know, when, um, I think it's like a, a Jordan Peterson quote and forgive me for quoting him, but it's like something, <laughs> something, about, something about like, um, like if, if you're afraid of what strong men can do, you just, you'll have to be terrified of what, of what a weak man can do. And oh, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you All know, right. I'd never heard um, that. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. And it's like, this is what mm -hmm. I, this is how I think about like men who are not in touch with themselves sexually and fear for their ability to like attract people and haven't cultivated a real relationship with their sexual energy. Um, that can really get to dark places and people can yeah, totally. develop themselves and be in self development circles and make lots of money and stuff like that and be in positions of power, but have not really prioritized this part of their lives. And, um, you know, some really dark things can happen there. And so I'm really excited mm -hmm. to start exploring this and for you guys to offer this as a, as a thing. Um, just I, it's, this is a really important societal blind spot to start, um, pouring a flashlight yeah, into and out. yeah. Mm -hmm. And reducing the social stigmas around, um, you know, what you're genuinely attracted to and how you respond to it and just all that kind of stuff, you know? And so, yeah. um, yeah, yeah so I'm really, yeah, really excited about this. Yeah. 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 I do want it to be, um, obviously we're going to be doing a lot of teaching and maybe some mm -hmm. correcting on like the Enneagram space and stuff like that. But I really do want it to be like a place of encouragement. Like I want people to yeah. come out yeah. being like really have like a sense of, um, uh, like, like feel entitled to their own sexual instinct. You should feel entitled to what you are right. tr attracted to <laughs> and what you like about yourself. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that, you know? So I, that's a main goal of mine. And thanks for uh, your support, Josh. And very excited to teach with Alexandra. Uh, <laughs> I think that'll be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, on that adorable note. Um, okay. <laughs> well, we'll close. <laughs> and um, all right. We'll see you guys hopefully in the course. All right. All right. See cool. Ya. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, Josh. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation with John and Alexandra about the sexual instinct. If you would like to join their class, you can go to the Enneagram School's website at www.theenneagramschool.com. And you can also just go directly to the page for the course, which is theenneagramschool.com backslash sexual hyphen instinct hyphen class. Again, there will be a link in the show notes to check it out. If you are watching this conversation on YouTube, then I invite you to please click the like button and the subscribe button. It's a zero cost and very effective way to support me and our work and the Enneagram School. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can leave up to a five-star review. All right, that is it for me. Thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next episode.